So welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And again, I've joined up with Silverstone Auctions to do an auction preview. Now, the last one we did was around the 20th of February. And wow, there's some things happened since then in the world of auctions and well, everything really. Um, yeah, complete lockdown. I, um, poor old Silverstone Auctions had two auctions that have had to be postponed, but they're finally with the government instructions to we can now do a little bit of uh, work as long as we social distance it. They're going to have the next sale is due on May the 23rd. So I'm doing a preview of that sale and I've come down to Henry's Car Barn where all the cars are actually in storage ready for this sale and explain how it's all going to work. Now, because of the uh, restrictions uh, we're now under with this coronavirus, this auction is actually not going to be um, with the buyers in the same room. What's going to happen? It's an online auction. Everything is going to be the same. Jonathan, the auctioneer, will be au auctioning the cars on Saturday. And it starts at two o'clock. And to bid, where well, you're either going to do it on telephone online or commission bid. So all that sort of stays the same. The one thing you can't do is actually be in the room on the day um, when the hammer falls, unfortunately. But it all seems this, this trade, over the last few weeks of this lockdown, the one thing that has been happening is quietly in the background, these sort of cars, people have been looking at the classifiers and actually doing quite a lot of trade. So there's been quite a lot of interest in this auction. There's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, so I think it's time to dive in. Now, there's a row down here that have all come from one particular collection and they've all been in storage for a while. They've been sold as non-runners, which is not the whole truth because quite a few drove in. But because they haven't had much maintenance over the last few years, they've been sold as non-runners. I think there might be some bargains to be had here. And there's unusual stuff. Have you ever seen a Ford Granada Coupe? I've never, I've sort of seen pictures of one of these. They weren't actually sold in the UK. This one is come in from South Africa. I don't think it's got any even, even a guide price. Um, so it's 80,000 kilometers. So yeah, there's some few interesting cars. This is one of the show you, and that's one of them. Another one is this Rolls Royce, a Rolls Royce Silver Spirit. Um, again, a no reserve car, 30,000 miles, drove in here. What's that going to go for? I mean, it's a great big lump of car, but having known that shadow I've got for, a, um, well, a couple of years now, these are such an occasion car, I'm sort of tempting it. It's in the right colours. It's had a full service history, but um, the current owner can't find it, unfortunately, at the moment. But I've looked at it. It's not rotten. It's all been in dry storage. It just means needs to find a nice home when someone's really going to look after it. So there's all sorts of other strange things. I can't go into the vanguards and there's a little Fiat 126 here. Um, a coupe Rolls Royce, a Corniche. Now, 77,000 miles. These cars, when they're in good conditions, are pretty sought after. You're talking 40, 50,000 pounds for one of these. This one, I think his guide, no, has it got a guide on it? I think it has a guide on it. No, it's no reserve, no reserve. I would expect that would be sort of 12,000 pounds or something in the guide, but just rare cars. If you're looking for a project, I think that's a good one to go for as well. All wards, MG, goes on and on. There's actually one more car I want to show at the end that I've never seen in an auction before. Let's go and have a look at that. Now, what I wanted to show you is this 1967 Citroen Ami 6. Go find another. They're the weirdest looking cars ever. Um, the running gear in one of these is like a, a 2CV, Ducheville. And it just reminds me of those French holidays I used to go on with my parents in the 60s and 70s. These were all over France. Never saw them anywhere else apart from France. This is actually French, this one, left-hand drive. And uh, from the day they appeared, they are just the weirdest looking cars. They, they were meant to be the more sensible version. You, you know, 2CV, the Super C, the 2CV or the Diane 6, they had a bit more space inside. I see from the description they say um, it's a little tarred, the interior, etc. No, I don't think it is. That's how they looked, sir. That's, I can remember them in period. That's about how they looked, all the interior. I love it. It's even got its original Citroen sticker on the back. But that... They had an umbrella gear change in the front, just coming out the dash, a single spoke wheel. So flipping French and so Citroen. I bet it doesn't fetch a lot of money, but there's a characterful car for you. Right, there's lots of cars to get through today. There's a bundle of them outside. Let's go and have a look at those now. 
Right, I wanted to show you this group of cars. First off, this Range Rover CSK. This is the limited uh, edition they did, 200 of them, to celebrate 20 years of Range Rover. It's, um, well, obviously it's a two-door Range Rover when there was four-door, obviously, in production at the time. They added anti-roll bars and things. They gave it a chrome bumper and uh, they're pretty sought after. And uh, if you're gonna have a cool Range Rover, I would suggest this is the one. And this particular one, well, it's been lavished um, on it. Uh, it's had a restoration lavished all over it. There's a lot of money spent on this car and it's pretty special. If I look at this, it's had 40,000 pound restoration in 2009. Having owned these Range Rovers, they do like to go rusty under the skin. They might be aluminium all here, but there's plenty of metal under the skin and on the chassis that needs quite a lot of work. So 40,000 pounds on body restoration. And then it was owned by Lord Rothschild at the time and he decided it hasn't got quite enough performance, so he put a five litre lump in it with 300 horsepower as well. Um, so in all, it's had about 60,000 pounds spent on it, and it's probably the best CSK I've seen, a usable CSK, and it's guided at 50 to 55,000 pounds, which I promise you, if you try and get one in this sort of condition, it's a mighty expensive thing, and I think that's great. Yes, it's not original, but I think the next owner is going to really enjoy that car. Now, if you want a restoration project, let's have a look at the one next door. This is the face of Vega. Now this one, 1960, and as you can see, it's not in a very happy state. Um, this one was fully restored. Have, have a look at the history. Uh, receipts on file for over £100,000 restoration. It then achieved a UK record price. Uh, when it was sold and driven by Quentin Wilson for BBC Top Gear as well. So it's a very famous car if it's had the hand of Quentin Wilson on it. Um, but unfortunately, the fire, as you can see, has done irreparable damage to it. Weird, I mean, it still runs. It just drove out here. Um, things like the lights and the um, grill bits missing, they're all with the car. And I don't know, I just think the face of uh, Vega is a wonderful thing, crazy French car. Basically, it was a take on, it was a French ultimate luxury sporting car. Had um, American V8 in it, I'm not exactly sure what spec this one is, but they, they went well, these things. Um, can't tell you what horsepower it is. Some of the parts, it's a restoration project, but it wasn't rusty. It, it had won all sorts of awards before it had the fire, and it's guided fairly sensibly at 50 to 60,000 pounds. I think you're going to put another 60,000 into it anyway. But there is something about doing a restoration, having done it. It was a journey, it's two or three years, and it's just wonderful seeing the craftsmen. So it's not all about values, it's the pleasure you get from bringing this back to absolute pristine condition. Now, a different car completely now, because this little Lotus Europa 1971 has had, again, so much money lavished on it, because it had a full restoration that's taken 12 years to get to this sort of condition. I have a bit of a soft spot for the Lotus Europa. I just think when this came out in um, late 60s and early 70s, there was one part down the road from where I used to live and it just looked the coolest thing, this wedge, this mid-engine little car, um, and had all the Lotus magic. It was like the badge on it. World champion car constructors, four of them, 1970, 68, 65, and 63. Lotus were untouchable for handling. They were the driver's car in this sort of period. And this Europa is sort of the, everybody thinks of the Elan, but this was Colin Chapman's. He wanted a mid-engine car to celebrate the race cars. And this is what they came up with. Now, originally when it first came out, it had a little Renault engine and it was a little bit soft and a bit slower than it should be. But in 71, it got a twin cam engine and this is one of those. And it's not an ordinary twin cam because during the 30,000 pounds that was spent on this car, they tweaked the engine to 145 horsepower. It's got some additions I'm not quite sure about. Pinstripes around here, well, that is what you used to do in the 70s, but I'm not sure about this really extended dam. That is a bit excessive, but it's a nice color combination. This, you know, Roman purple was a color of the 70s, oatmeal interior, and if I lift the back of it, it's just really nicely presented under here. There's um, red um, cam covers, big, 40s and probably 45s. I haven't actually looked at their 45 carbs on it, open carbs. It's going to sound an absolute treat. 
And I, even though it's had all that money um, spent on it, it's guided at 20 to 26,000 pounds. It's done about 2,000 miles since being restored. It's one of those I'm going to be trying not to bid on, but um, I just think they're really nice things. And now the heavyweight British car is this. This is the Bentley Mulliner, well, sorry, Bentley Continental Mulliner R. This is a wide body version. This was at the end of the run of the Bentley Continental. There was the T and that got the higher horsepower and things and it was in a shorter wheelbase. And then they did these, which are basically an R with the Conti T upgrade. So the more powerful engine and the wider body here, you can see it has wider arches, just more extended. And I love inside that you actually got the turned aluminium dash as well. I mean, this one is, really nice they were right at the end of production they only built 46 of these so super rare i mean it's a rare enough car as well and they were the most expensive version it started at 225,000 pounds when this car um, was in production this car is 2000 39,000 miles and guided at 72 to 82,000 one day these will take off in value because they are the ultimate hand-built Mulliner Bentley of the period and I think really elegant. So there you go, some different cars. There's another four cars over here I want to show you now. Okay, the car I want to show you now is this 1977 Porsche 911 Targa. Uh, it's actually a 78 model year because it was registered right at the end of 77. That means it's first of the three litre engine. And I just think it's as tidy as anything. I just love the backstory to this car. First of all, I like this period because you've got the stainless steel hoop. It's so classic Targa 911. You also got a, a Targa top that packs up quite nicely. They um, have a clever uh, folding mechanism. It just, you can fit it underneath. But it's the story behind this little car. It's also in the right colors and the pinstripe um, upholstery, etc., and the cookie cutter wheels. Because this car was, the original owner bought it, very happy with it, done about 3,000 miles in it, went on holiday, sort of Easter time, and got a phone call from the police, said, uh, your car's been stolen. Oh no. And uh, so that was that, as far as he concerned. But nine years later, he had another call from the police, said, we found your car. And uh, so this car, was with a sort of low life for nine years who didn't sort of move it on didn't break it obviously liked it and it was in excellent condition so the original owner bought it back and he then continued to own it to 2005 so he's sort of unbroken ownership up until 2005 apart from this nine years with low life who nicked it and then sort of kept it in a barn didn't know what to do with it but a really tidy, super low mileage one. It's got all the right names sort of in the service history. It's been served by Auto Farm, Francis Tuttle, Porsche Centre, Brooklyn. Only 23, tw sorry, 24,000 miles, just perfect. Um, guided at 55 to 65,000, which is top end, but it's a really tidy, and with that backstory, I can quite understand it. Now, next car I wanted to show you is this one. Now this is obviously a, a 2.7 RS, but it isn't. It's a um, replica replication um, off a 911 E's. So it's the right period, and this is right-hand drive, and it originally lived in Australia. And then at about 90,000 kilometers, the owner decided, I want to turn it into a 2.7 RS. And it was fully done by uh, um, people in Australia to a really high standard. So new engine, fortune spent on it to get it absolutely bang on. It was then sold to um, someone in the UK, I think it's 2013, and he then decided he wanted to do a bit more of the interior, tidy up the paintwork. And I have to say, I've seen so many of these 2.7 replicas. This is super tidy, this one, genuinely beautiful paintwork. It looks like it's all been machine flatted, the right tires, etc. It is guided at 75 to 90,000 pounds, but it's one of those, the real ones are still 400,000 pounds or thereabouts. The base car, a 911E, is about the same price as that. So you're getting a 2.7 RS for the same price as the base car, and we're particularly tidy, and I'm just a complete sucker for the Viper Green as well. Right, let's have a look at this Ferrari. So this is a 99 Ferrari F 360, right at the start of production. Um, it's got the F1 gearbox, this one, 
but I just love the red and the crema interior and it's super tidy. This is only 7,000 miles from new. But what really attracts me about this one, this has had regular servicing despite the miles and just been sitting there. This has been pampered and really looked after. The thing about the 360, 355 that went before, some people you know, prefer those, but they are fickle. They do have um, some issues with um, cracking manifolds and things and on the body there's a funny join where it's steel and metal and they crack there they're as tough as nails as far as i'm concerned of 360 they really can do the miles as this owner unfortunately hasn't found out with any 7,000 miles f1 gearbox does slightly devalue if you've got the manual they're more sought after but that is as as fresh as they come it's a 20 year old car with 7,000 miles on it and every single stamp in the book um, it's guided at 65 to 75,000 pounds but if you're after a 360, I would suggest that's a particularly tidy one. Another favourite of mine, the Mercedes SL55. Um, I had a brief period of um, sort of owning one of these when I was at Evo, and it was a shocker. It was the first time that um, supercharged engine uh, was introduced, a um, 5 litre supercharged, 5.5 litre, sorry, uh, supercharged engine and it had boy did it have some muscle two things i'd ordered one of these an sl 500 with a foldy top mercedes says well we're not going to tell you but we're just going to delay your order and uh delayed it a few months and then they announced this one and i basically got the second car in the uk a certain mr dennis at mclaren got car number one but i was very lucky to get car number two and mine was black and it had these turbine wheels and what a weapon it was i didn't keep it very long I can remember during the time, it's, the engine is completely dominant of this car. It is thunderous. So during my time of Eva, I remember talking to Gordon Murray about this car and he was absolutely livid when this came out because he was working on the SLR behind the scenes at McLaren. And Mercedes lent a de-restricted SL55 to Automotor and Sport for their annual high-speed test in sort of December. And this thing did 200 miles an hour because it had the speed restrictor taken off it and there was Gordon Murray trying to develop the SLR he said what am I meant to be doing that if they're letting this out to the press so they are extraordinary cars this one is only done 24 25,000 miles from new and I think that's you you will be surprised whoever buys this was in for a shock when they actually go and see just how quick it is and it's guided at fairly sensible money and it's guided at 25 to 30,000 pounds they're always going to be worth that. Um, I think that's a great buy and uh, I'm quite fancy having another go in one of those cars because I've only got fond memories of it. Right, there's some more cars around the corner. Let's go and have a look at those. Now, I'll just pull this one out because this is um, DB9 Volante. This is a 2005 car and these are getting to sort of what I think are a bit of a bargain price. Um, the only downfall with the DB9 is they sold really well, and there's a lot of them in the market. So this Volante, 45,000 miles, there's a little bits of uh, tire and do. I'd like the seat to be cleaned and things like that, but that is guided at 25 to 30,000 pounds. It's a V12 Auto Aston Martin, very elegant. I think the, time, the design is really aging extremely well. But there's an unusual car beside it, so um, it's really um, nice to look at. There's a, this is a Maserati Marac SS. So this has the V6 engine. This is very late in its production. What year is this one? 1984, 16,000 miles, unrestored, all with it. Lovely interior, sort of um, cloth interior with the um, sort of tartan pattern as well. There are things on it. Somebody's dropped on the bonnet there, that sort of thing. It does tell me, though, this car is basically untouched. What with the V6, obviously, is, um, there's the V8 versions of these Bora. The V6 Marat meant you got two little dinky rear seats in the back. Um, but I just think it's a great design. I love the Campagnola uh, wheels on it as well. Super rare thing. And uh, you get this all looking right. It's one of those that will be sort of sought after at shows and events because they're so rare. 16,000 miles from new, uh, 220 horsepower this version and guided at 65 to 75,000 pounds. 
Right, we'll come to the SLS in a minute. I just want to show you this though. This is the R129 Mercedes SL. This is a 500 SL, this example. One of the very last. This is um, year 2000, only 28,000 miles. And I know it's the very last one from the um, wheel design. It's got Xenons on it. SL500 was quite a rare um, choice when this was around. It was a 320 as well. And this was from an era of Mercedes when they just built them like bank vaults and they were done to a price. They were expensive cars in this era. It's got a glass panoramic roof. Obviously, it's a soft top. You have to, you've got to um, stand for the roof. But they are such quality cars, these. I've got a real soft spot for them because it's what I think is real Mercedes engineering of the era. Um, I'm sure you'd have endless um, joys you know with this i've also found whenever i brought one of these home mrs metcalf is very pleased as well so they seem to go down particularly well with the fairer sex so anyway this one is guided i think it's at 25 28 thousand pounds no 20 to 25 thousand pounds which i think is you know you can't go really wrong and with one that sort of spec service and 28 thousand miles but an absolute favorite of mine the mercedes sls now when this came out it was a real statement car. Mercedes wanted to do, they had the SLR with uh, joint venture with McLaren and they said, no, we can do this in-house. And this car was the result with the gold wing doors. Such a statement, celebrates obviously the, their uh, Mercedes 300 SL previous era, the Mille Miglia famous one. But um, what a car this was. So this got the six litre twin turbo engine, um, 604 horsepower, proper thing. And it even got the dual clutch um, transmission in the tunnel, sort of carbon bodied as well. Little backstory on this car. There was a gentleman at AMG called Wolf Zimmerman, who I got to know via Pagani, because he was responsible for doing the 7.3 engines for Pagani at AMG. And this was part of his uh, remit as well, of developing this SLS. I went in a very early one, and he was showing me the paddle shift gearbox. He says, I want to make sure they never put an automatic gearbox in this. Uh, I don't want the, um, you know, being counted to say, oh, can you make it cheaper than an automatic gearbox? So he made the transmission tunnel really narrow, so you could never get an automatic gearbox in it. It has a dedicated dual clutch transmission, this car, transaxle in the back. I think these have collector um, label written all over them. They're never going to do a car like this. Um, beautiful uh, weight distribution, a proper GT Mercedes, the gold wing doors. Um, this one is really low mileage, 13,000 miles, lovely colour combination, and it's guided 125 to 140,000 pounds. They've come up a bit, but that's still, if you buy that for 125,000 pounds, well, I'm very jealous, right? Another little group of cars over here. Now a slightly unusual XTS. I've pulled this one out because it's the first one I've ever seen in an auction because this is the Le Mans version of the XJS. They, Jaguar won Le Mans in 1990 and to celebrate they did a limited edition XJS and this is one of those. They only built, I think it was 280 of them. This is car number 58 and you recognise them by the sort of twin headlights. Yes, US got this as well, but this is a UK spec car. She sold um, Stratford of uh, Mayfair. This was originally registered January 91. You've got sport suspension and you've got these um, crossed um, alloy wheels and, a, and you open the door on the sill, it says number 58, Le Mans proper rare car seems to be very good condition we just spotted a different color coach line on it for some reason and it's um, guided at 20 to 25 thousand pounds but it's only 24 thousand miles it looks to be in perfect condition and a pretty rare car now this is a strange car this jaguar d-type it it's ba its base is a 1962 e-type but it was built by the best in the business for um, D-type replica. It's, it's almost isn't a D-type replica. It's, it's a blueprinted proper car and had FIA papers that actually just run out in 2016. But it's guided very sensibly, so I pulled it out. Now, the one strange thing, the elephant in the room, is this roll cage. And apparently this car was used for passenger rides, etc., and with a, a sort of... Um, track experience company 
And the one thing that their insurance company um, insisted on was a roll cage. It's dead easy to remove. It's just bolted in. It's just because of its just last few years it was doing these passenger rides for people to experience what a real D-type is. But there's a lot of original D-type parts on this car. Wheels, gearbox, um, carburetor. Uh, the, the engine is correct as uh, 3.4 straight six. And I mean, disc brakes all around. It wouldn't take a lot of work to get its FIA papers back on this because they only ran out in 2016. And then you've got entry to all sorts of things. With D-types being in several millions, I think this is very sensibly guided at 225, 275. Um, it just looks a bit strange with that roll cage, but underneath, it's a proper bit of kit. Now, I've just pulled this one out. Um, we've done a lot of SLs, it seems, today, but this is an SL65. This is sort of special order um, car because this was the first SL that went over 600 horsepower, 604 horsepower. I've done quite a few miles in one of these. It is what my um, dear friend, uh, sadly passed away, Russell Bolden would call weapon grade. This is a weapon grade SL V12 twin turbo, monster power 604 and 770 um, foot pounds of torque looks the part extremely rare and i think it's a collector car potentially in the making i love the color well i would because it's purple um, but i think it's guided at around the 45 50 thousand pounds it's one of those go find another right lovely little group of bmws next Okay, I brought these three BMWs together and they're all owned currently by JK of Jamiroquai and they are absolutely stunning. I want every single one of them. Three litre CSL, this is 1972. This is the lightweight version of this epic German touring car racer. You saw them on track in, in the 70s in the wonderful um, M colours with the Batmobile, the sort of the big wing on them. But this was the gentleman's road car version of it. Limited, just over a thousand of them built. And this one is just perfect. There isn't a speck of rust, it's all been rebuilt and looks wonderful in these colours. It is guided at 135 to 155,000, but it is, Silverstone admit it's the, the best they've seen, it's the best I've seen, bucket seats in it, that sort of wood dash and that howling straight six. Then there's this. Now, we looked at a few M3s, E30 M3s, but not quite like this one. The, JK did this one specifically because he wanted to have a look at a tarmac rally, how he would, that would go. So he went, he entered one, I think it was in Mallorca, and uh, this has just come back from it, and it's prepped beautifully for that. The engine, I would just park it with the engine up, lid up, because it's all got this carbon fibre intake on it, fantastically dressed engine, 260 horsepower now, it's 2.5 um, liters, so like the um, Evo Sport spec. This was based on an, on an M3. This isn't a, a sort of three series made into an M3. This is a proper 2.3 M3 upgraded to this sort of road going race spec, um, but usable on the road. It's still got carpets in it, still got electric windows and things like that, but it's also got a cage and bucket seats and things. And the best engine I've ever seen, proper suspension, wonderful negative camera at the rear. I'm told it drives terrifically. It's got short, um, short drive um, gear change on it, lovely no, non-airbag wheel, etc. It just looks the part. And I really, really want that one. And it's really sensibly guided at 48 to 56,000 pounds. There's easy 50, 60,000 pounds worth of work on it. And look at it. Like, it's just fantastic. And then there's this, Alpina. This is a 1983 B9 Alpina, so 3.5 litre, straight six in it. And I love it. I just love it to bits. I love everything about the Alpina decals. Inside, it has the best trim you've ever seen. It's velour with these sort of stripes going up the um, Recaro seats. JK likes this car as well. I can't quite understand why he's selling it. It's 135,000 miles, but it is in perfect condition, used regularly. And just the coolest thing ever as a road car. And uh, guided very sensibly at 25 to 30,000 pounds. These have a cult following. Uh, forget the mileage, just look at it. 25,000 pounds for that. I'll have that. Right, one more car I want to show you, and that's inside. Right, well, the final car, what an exciting car it is. The 1984. 
Peugeot 205 T16 World Rally car, Group B. Really interesting history of this car. This was built actually by Peugeot Sport UK for a US rally enthusiast because he wanted to race it in the States. There's works carts out there. This is sort of semi-works. Everything is an um, E1, Evolution 1, and it's done everything. All the rallies, I love the signatures. All the World Rally Champions have signed this car. It's a car, if you ever go to Goodwood Festival of Speed, this is the Peugeot 205 T16 you see rattling around there. Race retro, all sorts of places. Really, it spent a lot of its time doing competition. It was first in the States. Original owner sadly died in a plane crash and it then actually went to New Zealand and it raced a lot over there and then came back to the UK and has been racing here as well. But look at it, it's such a wonderful era, this Group B. And this car being built by Peugeot um, Sport UK is actually much better valued than the real works car. And it comes with a complete spares package. And because it's been regularly used, there's no recommissioning to do on this car. It's ready to go as you see it. And it's just, but even, even if they turn the petrol taps off, uh, just look at it, look at it in your garage. Registration I love on it as well, it's 205 T16. Because these are sort of road cars, because they have to drive between the stages. It's guided at 260 to 290,000 pounds, which sounds a lot, but it's about half price of a world rally car. There are so many more cars I wanted to show you in here. Um, there's a couple of Alans there, there's a, a rally Alan that's just come back from the Monte Carlo historic. Aston, Spectre, Defender, all sorts of things in here. Oh, I wanted to really wanted to show you the two. There's some uh, Porsche 944 turbos, which I think are looking really good value at around the £20,000 mark. Loads of things. The sale is coming Saturday. We've got a bit more time with this auction between the, the, this release going out and then the actual auction itself. It's Saturday, May the 23rd, starts at two o'clock. You can look online, look at the Silverstone website. There, all the cars are listed there and all the details. If you're gonna bid, where well, you have to register in advance. You can watch the auction live. If you go onto the Silverstone website again and you need to register, you can leave telephone bids, whatever you wanna be. So all under this lockdown, current situation, everything's the same with the auction. It's just, you can't actually attend on the day. Again, if you want to view these, any of these cars, you have to phone up in advance and they'll give you a one hour slot to have a look at the cars. So there you go. I love doing these auction roundups. I hope you enjoy them as much as I do as well. If you do, well, keep watching, keep subscribing because there'll be more videos coming along very soon.